I know a lot of people have questions about water, especially in a desert like southern Utah that has a large quantity of golf courses and a rapidly growing population. So, like a horse to water, I stormed off to the Water Conservancy District to get some answers. They have tons of information and everyone was exceptionally helpful. The board consists of seven members, whom are elected by the Washington County Commission, and their job is to conserve, develop, manage, and stabilize the water supply in Washington County. Today, we meet with Zachary Renstrom, the GM. Where does our water come from? How much water do we have? Should we be concerned? And if so, what can we do to help? Check it out. Thank you, Zach, for meeting with us today. It's good to be here, thank yeah. you. I would like to understand the entire process of how we get our drinking water. Can you explain where that water is coming from and the process it goes through from natural source to kitchen faucet? Sure, it's actually quite a complex problem and, and, and where we get our water and it varies throughout the year, it changes. We're located in the Virgin River Basin and all our water that we use for culinary drinking, uh, the farmers all comes from this small little river basin, the Virgin River. Generally, we get our water, first of all, just our rainfall. How it gets to your tap is two locations. Is first of all, we have a lot of wells throughout the community, and that's where we just drill a hole into the ground and, and pump the water out. Um, but the majority of our drinking water actually comes from a big diversion right on the Virgin River. And we take water from the Virgin River, and we put that water into Sand Hollow Reservoir and Quell, and then we take the water out of those reservoirs and treat them. And then we can take that water and pretty much send it to 90% of the community. 90% of the population is directly connected to the water district's pipes. Is Quail and Sand Hollow connected? The water yeah. will go from Quail to Sand Hollow? We could push it either way. With, with water systems, we want them to be very robust. So if a pipe breaks, we need to transfer water. And so we actually have multiple pipes going back and forth it's between the two. And then we have ways we can move water around to different areas of the community. I was asked the other day if the water coming out of the faucet is drinkable. It's drinkable. It's yes. drinkable. Okay. We're, we're actually very, very fortunate because where our watersheds are either located above Zions National Park or wilderness area, our water is actually quite pristine. You know, we, we do have turbidity issues like during floods, turbidity is when it gets a little bit milky, but our water treatment plant specifically designed to, to handle that. We pretty much have no detectable limits in our water, meaning mm. that we have really pristine water. We're fortunate to have good water. Tell me a little bit about how you measure our water. Yeah, so how we kind of look at the water availability and we really have to look at what's called safe yield. Because here in the desert, one year we'll have floods and the next year we'll have droughts. And so we have this extreme variability that we have to account for. And so we have really good historical data um, over 100 years saying, oh, this is what the watershed can produce, and this is how much safe yield we have. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's how we kind of determine it. It's just looking off those historical records. Mm -hmm. we, we've actually now are starting to look at what's called the paleo record, where we're starting to look at tree rings that go, we, so we really actually have fairly good records that go almost 2,000 years back based on oh. those tree rings. And we can say, okay, this is the safe yield of the river, and this is how much we can rely on. Mm -hmm. And that's how we kind of determine how much we have. Is it, it's not really something that you like have a f definitive number, this is how much water we have. It's more kind of like a guesstimate type thing. Well, that, it, it's an engineering calculation. It's, and we have a little bit of ranges. So we know we have certain obligations to U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So in the Virgin River and the, and the Santa Clara River, we have certain species that are either listed or endangered. Mm -hmm. And so we have to maintain those habitats to protect that, those fish and the birds. And so then we say, okay, we also have obligations to certain farmers that we have to meet. And then the, the excess is basically what we have for drinking water. Mm -hmm. um, we know this, you know, the yield of the Virgin River is generally about 100,000 acre feet of water. Mm -hmm. And so then you say, okay, well, the fish needs this much water, the farmers get so much, and then we, we divvy it up. And, mm -hmm. and that's one of the functions of those two large reservoirs is when we have excess water, let's say during the springtime, we can divert the water to those reservoirs and store it for the summer months. At what point do the red flags start going off saying, okay, we're, we're approaching a drought? 
So the national government actually will come out and declare whether we're in a drought or not. And so they have, you know, certain levels of drought. And so they will come in and say, this area has not received any measurable rainfall for a period of time. They have certain metrics that they look at. Mm -hmm. So the federal government will come and say, this area is in a drought mm -hmm. and this is the category it's at. Locally, how we respond to that is two ways. Is first of all, well, of course, we're looking at the same data they are. But when we see these droughts coming on, uh, we reach out and try to encourage our residents to use water wisely. The governor came out with a very aggressive, you know, slow to flow. Mm -hmm. And we sent out some messaging and we actually could see a measurable drop in the amount of water people were using. But there is Utah State Code that would allow certain measures to start taking an effect where a city would have to step in and say, listen, we, we can't have people, you know, watering lawns if we don't have water for tap. A city has the authority to declare an emergency and make certain steps. So that would be like you could only water your lawn every other day type thing? Right now, we all the cities have some type of ordinance talking about when you can water your lawns. This would be more an emergency declaration saying these things need to happen. And so they could come in and say, there's no outside watering, period. St. George City actually has had several of those in the past. If you look at the history of St. George, there were multiple times that the city mayor had to stand up mm -hmm. and basically make rules to conserve the water that they had at the time. Do you recall when the last time that was, what year it was? As, as close as the 1980s, mm -hmm. basically they said, we're not going to give any more building permits to this area of town because we don't have any water. And so that was the last last one where the government kind of came in and took a very you know strong approach. But if, if you go back um, and look like in the 50s and and a, like earlier than that, if you start reading those old records, they had rules about what you could use the water for and what you couldn't and how it operate. And so two things have happened is, first of all, the average water use per person has decreased substantially since the 80s. And, and even since, you know, 2000, our water use has decreased by 30 percent per person. You know, we, we're adding on more projects. Mm -hmm. So we just recently got done constructing a little treatment plant right by Sand Hollow Reservoir, where we can take water there now and push it to a new area. We're able to either push water to certain areas of Hurricane or push the water down to St. George, Washington okay. area. Right now, there are three water treatment plants okay. in the area. Quail, Sand Hollow. And then up in Gunlock, there's one too. Okay. Now with well water, so that's where we just drill the hole and we pump that water out. That is, That doesn't need to be treated. However, we still put chlorine in that water to make sure it stays safe to drink. A lot of the questions come back is, okay, we're in a desert, we're growing so fast, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. And so today, if a home is being built today, we have water for that home. Mm -hmm. The question comes up with growth. And so how we deal with growth is a couple ways, actually two ways is first of all, just encourage people to use water wisely and that lowers the demand. And then of course we have new projects coming on. And so right now uh, in our county, we're looking at three new reservoir projects that will be starting to be constructed here very shortly. We have two other reservoirs um, after that that we're looking at doing the environmental documents on there. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of a constant process of saying, okay, here's the growth and demand. Mm -hmm. And to deal with that, we have to build the infrastructure to meet it. Warner Valley Reservoir, is that one of them? So the three that are, are on, uh, we're actually under design right now is one called Dry Wash, which is over in Ivins. It's mm -hmm. kind of uh, located right next to the Ivins Reservoir. Mm -hmm. Uh, one is called Graveyard, which is located basically right there by Santa Clara's public work offices where they have some shops. Mm -hmm. And then we have Tokerville Reservoir, which is right off Anderson Junction. Oh. So the other two that are kind of a little bit farther out are Cove Reservoir, and that's located up in Kane County above Zions National Park. It'll be a small little reservoir. And then Warner Valley is also on that list. Where is the water coming from for the three that are being drawn up right now? That's the neat thing about our system. It's just not one source. It's multiple sources. Mm -hmm. The ones on the Santa Clara Riverside, um, most of that will be from two sources. Either during a wet year, we'll take that water from Gunlock and store it in there. Or during drier years, we're actually going to take our sewer water we're currently taking our sewer water and treating it. We're just going to expand that facility and start storing that water up there. And so that will be connected. They'll be connected underground from Gunlock. They already are. Actually. They already are. We right. actually already have a pipeline that goes all the way from Gunlock all the way to the sewer reuse plant. Okay. We're just going to add reservoirs to that mm -hmm. line, essentially, to That's get that awesome. water. The three that are being drawn right now, are they going to be recreational? All three of them uh, will have recreation around them. Okay. With that, it'll be like, just paddle boards, mm -hmm. you know, maybe like a hiking trail around that. Yeah. Generally what we do with recreation 
is the district does not like running recreational facilities. It's just, we're not designed for that. And so we usually work with cities and let the city manage the recreation around our little reservoirs. So like Fire Lake Park is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. So that's owned and operated by the water district, but the city operates this, the little Fire Lake Park right there. Yeah. What can us as citizens and we as a community do to kind of assist in protecting our water? The easiest way and the thing that people can really do the most is just look at their own landscaping. If you come out with a water efficient landscaping, that will save thousands of gallons every month. We invite people to come up to our desert gardens and, and you know they walk around and it has lots of shade and lots of green, but yet we're using very little water compared to let's say a typical landscaping. If someone wanted to keep up with the water, where's the best place for them to go? We have, of course, our website. It's called uh, wcwcd.org. Or we have a meeting here uh, once a month here at the Water District. It's a public meeting mm -hmm. where the public's invited to come in and, and they hear all the operations and we, we talk about how the system's working and what improvements we need to make to the mm -hmm. system. Uh, we give tours at the water treatment plant if individuals want to see where, what we do to treat it. With our community growing so fast, mm -hmm. what is your take on recycled water communities yeah so the recycled water or reuse water and there's there's different terms to that oh, okay um, but we are a strong advocate of that our board here at the water district we just initiated a study that will go in and specifically look at what kind of infrastructure we need to build mm -hmm. and what's the most economic way to build it so we can really start capturing every drop of water with this new plan it's actually going to narrow it down to saying okay you need a pipe at this location at this size tell me a little bit about what's going on or what you know of with lake powell mm -hmm. right now um, i know the water is very low is that affecting us at all today lake powell right now the only way it's really affecting us is that we're in the process of going through the environmental documents with the lake powell pipeline the Bureau of Reclamation is in the process of updating their models to have a better idea of how the river is working. They've, they've always had models, so they just really want to update them. We just want to make sure that our environmental documents are using the, the latest science. So what is the status on the pipeline? So a draft EIS or a draft environmental study came out and was open to the public and we got lots of comments. With everything going on, we want to make sure we're addressing those comments. And we also want to make sure that we'll use any new model that's coming out so most likely here in the next couple of years, there'll be a new environmental document that'll come out. And then once we get the record decision, we'll, we'll, we'll start constructing it. Okay. The Lake Powell Pipeline is a multi-generational project. And you know that's actually very typical with, with large water projects. As an engineer, we, you know, we, we look at time periods. And so if you're engineering a building, that's usually a five-year project. Roads are generally about 10, maybe 15 years. But with these large water projects, you a quick project is a 10-year period. Mm -hmm. So most of these projects take 10, 20, mm -hmm. sometimes even 30 years. And so like Warner Valley, this community has been talking about Warner Valley for over 100 years. <laughs> In fact, they it was really interesting. I was reading some old congressional record where there was an individual that testified that they were, uh, had, they were going to actually go build Warner Valley, but then World War II broke out. And so th they put it on hold. Wow. So, so a lot of these projects just take that a long time. And I know sometimes people say, well, we've been talking about the Lake Powell pipeline for 10 years. And, th and that's true. Um, but it's kind of why these water projects just take a long time. We were expecting it to take yeah. that long. So, okay. and, and it's typical to go through that. The, the governor of Utah has said that it is a priority of his administration to get the Lake Powell pipeline built. Our Senate, our legislature, the Senate and the House have both agreed that this is a priority for the state of Utah. I think it'll get built because Utah is saying, hey, we need to get this built. If people are curious, we actually have a whole website specifically dedicated to the Lake Powell Pipeline. Oh, really? Where they can go on, okay. they can look at all the records, all the studies they've cool. submitted. Um, it has tons of graphics mm -hmm. and all of the information. So if, if somebody's like, hey, I really want to know all the nitty gritty, mm -hmm. they can go to that. It's lpputah.org. Okay. And, and they can go to that and really dive through and look at all the records that have been produced, all the studies mm -hmm. that have been produced. Once we're able to, you know, get that pipeline in, how much security does that give us? It, it's huge. Okay. Because right now, like I said, we're, we're basically on the Virgin River. 
and we know there's a huge amount of variability on the Virgin River. Mm -hmm. We have water shortages on the Virgin River nine out of 10 years. Mm -hmm. On the Colorado, it's a huge basin. And so if you have a little bit drier season up in Wyoming and you know Colorado mountains have more snow. And so the Colorado River, even though the, the Lake Powell is low, if you look at the history of the Colorado River, it's the most reliable water supply in the Western United States. Mm -hmm. And to tap in to the large infrastructure projects that have been built on the Colorado River, it'll just give us a lot more security moving mm -hmm. forward. We do have plans to make sure that everyone has the water that they need to be remain safe and healthy and to keep our economy going. Now, mm -hmm. in a biblical drought, people might not have green lawn, right. but you will have safe drinking water. Okay. As engineers, we really like to prepare for the extremes and so we design our systems for kind of worst case scenarios. So for example, our water tanks, when we design a water tank, it's just not for you know, the, your daily use. What we assume is it's, it's you know, Tuesday morning, everybody's taking a shower, everybody's sprinklers are going off water in their lawn, and then all of a sudden we have a five alarm fire. And so we build these really big tanks for these rare, rare events because we know the system can't fail. Mm -hmm. 99.9% .9 of the time that tank is oversized, mm -hmm. but it's one of those things that we have to have for that one, that rare scenario. And so we also look at droughts that way is like, okay, we have plants and scenarios in place for that really rare event. Mm -hmm. Chances are it'll never happen right. because we do have really good infrastructure. We look all the way from, you know, a terrorist incident that caught, could cause problems. And we have plans and scenario to a natural disaster, like a major drought. Mm -hmm. You have kind of those emergencies like situations like that mm -hmm. but then talking long term it's just that if we if we stop planning and stop thinking about the future it could be a threat to that future generation if you look at the, the water that's being used the vast majority of that water is just going to your, your typical residential home the school district has a lot of schools mm -hmm. and then generally have a lot of grass associated with those schools mm -hmm. they would be considered high water use now i always come back is that efficient use for our water well having a school and some playgrounds for the kids, I think that's a very efficient water use. We have a lot of grass here in the community that is decorative or not functional grass. And that's where we would really like to see that grass that's not being used to be removed. Black Desert, that new golf course coming up, is there any kind of worry about that? Yeah, so golf courses, it's, it's one of those balances that they, they do have an economic scenario behind them. And if you look at other desert communities in the Southwest that are in the desert, they, they have golf courses. Mm -hmm. um, but with Black Desert specifically, that's gonna be tapping into that reuse line between Gunlock. And so part of the year, it'll most likely be using water from Gunlock and other times it'll be using water from the reuse plant. Mm -hmm. And so with the golf courses, what we try to do is say, okay, here's, we're not gonna use culinary grade water, we're gonna use reuse or secondary water that's a little bit lesser quality and apply it to those high water use and still get the economic benefits and enjoyment out of that. Anything else preventing us from protecting our water supply? There's a lot of things that keep me up at night. <laughs> but one thing I feel very good about is that we have a really, really robust infrastructure uh, where we get our water from is very pristine areas. And so I think our current system is really efficient and it produces really high quality water. Um, and even if we have some of those other like emergencies, I, I feel confident that we could respond to those and we have resources to respond to those. The things that make me a little bit nervous is, is really looking at the future. So when we look at the future and we look at the growth populations that have been projected for this area, and I see the tools that we have, I'm not so much worried about the next five years or the 10 years. I'm really concerned about the next in 30 years or what's going to happen. And you know, in 30 years, I'll, I, I, I'll be retired and moved on as should be. But today, we're living off infrastructure that was built 10, 30, 50, sometimes 100 years ago. And I'm so grateful for those individuals that worked so hard to, to give us what we have today. And I just want to make sure that we're giving our future kids the same opportunities we had. I don't think it's something we need to fear, but it's something that we, we have to take it very, very seriously. We have to spend a lot of time and effort looking what we want to do. And, and that has been the history of this county. If you, if, like I, you know, I talked about the pioneers and how they came down here, and even how the Indians would look at water. It's one of those things, we live in the desert, water is a very scarce resource, and we need to make sure that we're using it very wisely and, and have that discussion of, 
what do we want to do with our water and how we want to use it? And, and what can technology do to help us, you know, expand the use of that water? And so, you know, this county has ran out of water multiple times before, and you know, we built infrastructure or technologies allowed us to do things to expand it. And, and we just have to take it seriously and continuously be careful with what we have so we don't lose it. Zach, thank you so much. Yeah, this has been seriously so helpful. Special thanks to Zach and everyone at the Water Conservation District. And thank you for watching and learning and caring about our community. I have a greater understanding and respect for our water. And in a weird way, it makes me feel closer to my community. The water you use is the same water I use. And I don't know why, but it, it's like the saying, brother from another mother, but the exact opposite of that. Does anybody else know what I'm saying? Thanks for watching and special thanks to everyone involved in making this episode. See ya.